<clears throat> so, um, yeah, today I wanted to go over some of the subtleties of uh, creating a video game for a vector uh, vector display, uh, like this oscilloscope that you're seeing this video game rendering on. It's not really much of a game, more like a tech demo, but um, there's kind of a lot that goes into making this sort of thing look reasonable and look good. So that's what I'd like to go into uh, today. Um, so to start off, uh, I thought it might be good to actually show you, I'd like to go over all the details about how I am drawing to this screen and how it's a little bit more difficult than you might initially think to draw to a screen like this. Um, the way that it's working is uh, it's, I'm drawing to it like an Etch-A-Sketch. I'm using an audio DAC to give three different voltage signals. Um, one voltage controls the position of the electron beam that is drawing to the screen on the x-axis, sorry, x-axis, uh, one on the one channel for the y-axis, and that's how I steer it around the screen, and then a third channel to modulate the brightness um, or the intensity of that electron beam. Uh, so by turning the intensity way down, I can basically just turn off the electron beam altogether so that it doesn't light up any of the phosphors on the screen um, at that time. And that's how I kind of turn off the beam as I move between shapes that I'm drawing. Um, that's kind of the, the general gist of this type of vector display. Uh, three channels. Uh, that's how I steer it around. That's how I control the brightness. So uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to... Uh, quickly ch turn off the um, the brightness modulation so that you can kind of more clearly see the uh, uh, electron beam as it uh, moves around the screen. So that there is <clears throat> um, the same thing that you were seeing before, except now I'm always keeping the brightness um, at kind of like a full brightness. Um, so you can see the beam as it moves between the different shapes. Um, now, it's actually, there's, there's more at play here, and I'm going to get into that in a moment. Uh, I'm going to switch over to a different scene, which is just a little test scene that I whipped up for tonight. So this is a dot. Um, you can see I'm just rendering a single dot on the center of the screen. Um, I will show you the code for it. It's pretty simple. Uh, it's, uh, I'm going to zoom in just to make sure that everybody can see that. Um, so this is the code for it. <clears throat> I'm creating an array of samples. So with my audio DAC, um, it is a stream of samples that I'm sending. I'm just feeding a buffer. Um, so I'm saying that the dot that I want to draw on the screen, it's just one sample. So my array size is just one here. Um, I give it a position of zero. Now this is in 3D space and I, I am using a 3D video game engine. So this, this sample will be translated into uh, screen space, which will result in just zero, zero on the screen because I have a, an orthographic camera that I'm using right now. So um, you can basically just ignore that Z uh, coordinate altogether. So I'm saying draw a point at zero, zero. And that there is what you see uh, on the screen. Um, let's see what else there is here. Uh, yeah, so boop, boop, doo. yeah, and then I just I, I'm I, I can send the way that my video game engine works. Um, I'm using extremely lovely unoptimized code where I'm just throwing around a bunch of lists and they're getting thrown out and a bunch of garbage collection. The great thing about running at 192 kilohertz is that compared to, let's say, a 4K display, this is this is nothing for a computer nowadays. So I can write super unoptimized code and it doesn't matter because it's such a low fidelity uh, device. It's great. Um, and it allows me to kind of prototype and whip this together really quickly. Um, yeah, so there is actually a little bit more that's at play here. Um, when I show you what this looks like on the screen, you can see that you know it goes nicely right up to the uh, the center, and then draws that dot, and then moves off. Um, that's actually oh, there's a little bit more that I've done here. Um, I'm gonna rerun this code where literally the only thing that I'm doing is I'm telling the audio DAC. Actually, I should show you one more thing here. Um, there we go. So I just uh, 
zoomed out basically by adjusting the voltages so that um well actually i adjusted the display so that it uh, kind of shows a different voltage range which is essentially just squishing the entire image on the screen so what you see at the bottom left um bottom left of the image there is uh, the blanking point. So when I'm finished, it's my video game engine's running at 80 frames per second. When I finish render rendering a frame, I move the electron beam off the screen. So it goes down to negative one, negative one, and then it sits there until the next frame, moves up, draws the dot, then goes back down and sits off screen. Um, now, I've just gone into my code and I've just turned off uh, some some blanking code that I had. Uh, so there we go. So this is actually uh, a little bit more accurate to um, uh, what I just the code that I had just shown. So the code there shows you know it's uh, sorry blue um, just one point. This is literally just one point. So you can see that the beam, um, it starts there in the blanking region. It tries to make its way up to uh, zero, zero, but it, I don't know if my camera auto focuses. Uh, let me just change that there. Sorry about this. Just gonna put this on to manual focus so that we don't have this issue anymore. There you go. Um, so yeah, you can see it moves off screen and then it tries to go up to zero, zero, but when it goes towards zero, zero, it ends up, before it even reaches there, it zips back down to the zero, uh, to the negative one, negative one. And the reason for that is that this is, you know, 192 kilohertz, so it tries to get up there, but then there's also a bunch of smoothing that happens on my audio DAC because it wants to make a nice smooth sound wave, which is beneficial for a lot of reasons, even in this display. Um, but yeah, it tries to get up there and then it immediately curves back. So that's why you get that little bit of a curve. So instead of um, uh, doing a point and then moving back immediately, uh, what I do with my game engine is uh, instead I have it spend a whole bunch of time doing a whole bunch of samples all the way up and kind of easing in and easing out. So it slows down as it approaches the point that it wants to rest on and then draws that point and then accelerates away and then settles back onto the blanking point. So if I was to turn back on that code that adds in those extra samples to slow the beam, uh, to slow the beam down as it approaches the point that it wants to settle on, then we get something that looks like this. And you can see it's actually reaching all the way up to that center point as I wanted it to. Um, and you can also see that the line, the blank, the line between the two points uh, is now brighter. And the reason it's brighter is because I'm actually drawing a whole bunch of little samples in between and having them slow down. So it's spending more time drawing. And as it spends more time drawing, that means that it becomes brighter. Um, so that there is how that blanking code works. Um, I'm just going to show you a couple more things about drawing shapes. So that was just uh, just one point. Um, let's say, yeah, I actually had some other code. Uh, another way to do this is I had just talked about that that code that injects um, a whole bunch of points. Well, there is another way that we could do it, and that is to simply draw one point, um, draw one point over and over again. So let's say I went and disabled that, uh, that code there that injects the extra samples. Um, instead, I could just say, okay, just draw that one point over and over and over again until maybe you eventually settle. Um, that ends up resulting on something that looks a little bit like this. So you can see that you know, the beam is flying up there, it's overshooting, it's kind of oscillating, um, and then eventually it sits, settles back onto that zero, zero point that I wanted it to be, and then you'll see a little bit of a, a kind of oscillation as you know this the smoothing that's happening on my audio DAC comes into play and then it whips back down so that's there's two different ways of doing that but you can see that this way is kind of messy it goes all over the place as it oscillates to try and rest um, but yeah the uh, the solution to that is to add in these extra samples that I just talked about and then you get a shape that looks a little bit more like this so that's kind of what we want the beam to be doing um, 
Yeah. So, um, hopefully that's making sense so far. I'm going to move on to show uh, a couple of other ideas here. This here is, I'm going to show the code for it first. Um, so now I've just got uh, four samples. Uh, one at 0.5, uh, sorry, negative 0.5, negative 2.5, 2.25, sorry, and then 0.5. So that results in a line, as you'd expect. Um, so the line, it's basically just going there from negative 5 to positive 5. Um, and you can see that it's pretty faint. Uh, that's because I'm not actually spending very many samples drawing that line. Um, so if I wanted to have a brighter line, um, I can just let's say lerp between <clears throat> uh, lerp between uh, two points using a whole bunch of samples. Let's actually do like 300 samples. So this will result in a nice bright line between uh, negative 0.75 and positive 0.75. And that just creates positions that are lerped between those two points. So now you can see it's a much brighter line. Um, and that was because before we only had four samples. Now we have 300 samples. And so basically I can use these individual samples to slow down the movement of that beam so that it moves slower across the screen. As it moves slower across the screen, it spends more time lighting up the phosphors and it becomes brighter. And that's kind of the, uh, the idea then behind, um, behind using the vector display and modulating the brightness of the beam purely based on how much time you're spending at a certain point on the screen. Um, yeah, so then we can go in and I can uh, re-enable my, um, my brightness modulation using the Z input of the oscilloscope. Uh, so this is that third audio channel, which I'm using to control the intensity of the electron beam. Um, and as I do that, oops, sorry about that, it results in something looks a little, little bit like this. And you can see that line is even brighter than it was before, and that's because I'm actually using that brightness not just to turn off the electron beam, but giving a negative voltage, which will then end up increasing the intensity of the beam. So now it's super bright line. Um, yeah, and that's kind of the gist of how that, uh, that extra input on the oscilloscope works and what allows me to control brightness. And you can see now that uh, on the far bottom left, you can see, still see the uh, every frame. Um, it is settling there for a very brief moment, um, and then whipping back up and drawing that line, and then settling back down. Um, this, this is because even though I've kind of adjusted the intensity of the beam to be much lower, it still has a little bit of intensity to it. I could turn the intensity on the uh, oscilloscope all the way down so that you don't even see it at all. So that's normally how it actually run the game. But um, uh, the way that I design my game is I like to have it so that that, uh, that beam uh, is actually entirely off screen. So I'll just zoom the image in, and now the beam's totally off the screen. I don't even need to worry about whether it's visible or not when it's resting there for a long period of time in between frames. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the gist of how that works. And this, at this point, I have, pretty, I have pretty solid control over what the electron beam is doing. Um, there was those two things, one, turning on and off the brightness, and then two, having um, the extra samples in injected to slow the beam down as it comes to rest on the point. I'll just show you, it might be interesting to see this. We'll take a peek. Uh, yeah, so here, I still have the intensity um, being set to very low intensity as it's moving towards the shape and away from the shape. But you can see that there's this wild oscillations like at the beginning and end of the line, and that's because I'm moving, trying to move instantaneously from the blanking region off the screen up towards the line. And you can see that it took time to do that. It took time to kind of settle onto the point, and then it draws the line, it gets to the other end, and then it starts to oscillate before it whips off the screen. Um, so yeah, these, these two, uh, two techniques 
of slowing down the beam and then also turning off the beam between shapes are kind of critical to making a, uh, a vector a vector shape um, without a bunch of other noise on the screen, basically. Um, yeah. So that's that's kind of the gist of how that works. And you can kind of see um, from the code that I showed uh, that these shapes are nothing more than just arrays of samples, uh, samples around the screen. Um, uh, yeah, so I can, I can make any arbitrary shape on the screen. Um, and then with these samples, uh, you can kind of think of them, if you're thinking about like a video game engine, a 3D video game engine, uh, that's kind of a, a little bit of a solved problem in a sense. And so um, similar kind of uh, solutions that you would use for a polygon-based 3D video game engine, you can apply them directly to the idea of these samples. So instead of uh, doing transforms on the vertices of a polygon, I can do transforms on these individual samples. And because I'm using modern computing hardware, I can go through, you know, uh, it's what, 2400, I'm going at 80, 80, uh, 80 frames per second, which, if I'm not mistaken, is 2400 um, samples per second. So 24, uh, sorry, samples per frame. Um, but 2400 samples per frame is not really too many to be able, on modern computing hardware, to go through that whole 3D uh, transform um, uh, process so I can transform those into uh, into 3D space basically, um, and then uh, sorry from 3D space into 2D space, and that's how I do my my video game engine. That's you know 3D video game engine. Um, yeah, so let's say I went into yeah, so I can go into my scene here. Um, I'm just going to turn my camera into a perspective camera and rerun this. Um, so now I can kind of move around and I can see this from different uh, perspectives. This is just using a Xbox controller to kind of have a first person view of this this shape in 3D space. So again, each and every one of those 300 samples that's being drawn along the, the shape um, is just being transformed using your standard uh, view projection matrix, world view projection matrix. Um, so another thing that uh, that comes into play is maybe when I have a shape, let's just draw a different shape. This is just getting a little bit into, uh, you know what, let's, let's actually just switch scenes all together. This is just a different scene. It's going to draw a different shape. So there's a, a shape that I'm I'm viewing on the you know 3D 3D shape being drawn. Um, as I as this shape gets smaller and smaller and goes off into the distance, um, I don't actually want to be spending as much time drawing that shape. I actually just. I turn the intensity down a little bit more so that you can see it better. But as, as that shape gets smaller on the screen, I don't want to be spending a whole bunch of time uh, drawing it because otherwise it'll, it'll start to become just like super, super bright. So uh, this, this whole problem of spending too, much, too many resources basically drawing a small object that's far off in the distance is a pretty pretty uh, common problem with any type of 3D video game engine, uh, whether it's, you know, on a vector display or whether it's, uh, you know, a polygon-based um, uh, raster uh, game engine. Um, so the idea, this, the kind of the solution to that is to have different levels of detail. So as things get smaller on the screen and further away, you can have different level of detail mesh, for example. Um, in my game, in my engine, um, what I uh, want to have is actually a dynamic fidelity. So instead of just like having different meshes as it steps off into the into the distance, well, I'm just sampling a shape. So why don't I just scale how much, how how what kind of fidelity of sampling I'm doing based on how close it is to the screen? Um, so I can actually turn that. Right now you're seeing it uh, with that kind of dynamic fidelity. 
Um, I'm just going to go in here and turn it off for you so you can see without. Um, So this here is the entire shape that you're seeing on the screen. Um, the one that just is like a curly circle. It's just a circle with a bunch of like little circles added to it. Um, and then with an animation um, that, uh, let's see. Uh, it's an animation where it will spend more time drawing the samples that are at a certain point and less time drawing the samples that are on the rest of the, the circle, and that's why we get that super bright point. Um, the super brightness is caused by spending lots of time at that point. Um, so going back to the code here, um, for each shape, I pass in a fidelity. So I could just say like, oh, don't use that fidelity at all. Um, have it always be like full fidelity. And now we're going to see that this is going to get super, super, super bright as it goes off into the distance, um, as it spends more and more uh, time on a small portion of the screen. So if you can remember what it looked like in the previous uh, demo, it didn't get that bright. Uh, so what's happening here is it's just spending way too much time trying to draw that. Uh, let's say we adjust it so that I'm spending a very small amount of time uh, drawing it. So let's just say instead, let's, let's spend, let's do 150 samples for the entire shape, regardless of fidelity. Let's just ignore the fidelity, which is the dynamic level of detail. And now we get a shape that looks like this. Um, pretty wonky. <laughs> um, and what's happening here is First off, like, yeah, it's just whipping around, uh, not really spending too much time. You can see that uh, because of the animation that I have that's, that's at play here, the animation will spend more time on that certain point and less time on all of the rest of the shape. So you can see it gets a little bit wobbly and wonky when it spends less time on it, but it's still crisp and clear where it's spending lots of time. I'm going to turn off that animation just so that we can get a better kind of view of this shape. So that animation, let's see. To do. Wrote this code a while ago, so I'm just rereading it and refreshing my mind. Yeah, so I'm doing a, an ease out power uh, to the power, I guess a power three ease out um, to modify the stepping along the uh, shape. So I can just turn off that. And now we get a shape that doesn't have any animation. And it's a little bit easier to see that this shape just kind of looks a little bit, I mean, it's super faint, right? Because it's not spending too much time drawing the shape. And it's also got this kind of like, doesn't look like crisp circles anymore. It's a little bit wonky. Let's, let's turn it down right now. That was at uh, 150. Let's put that at like, more like 50, let's say. Let's see what that looks like. Yep. So getting less and less detail. And this is kind of what is going to happen to that shape as it gets off in the distance, as, as the uh, fidelity decreases, with my kind of dynamic level of detail. Um, I could, I just had it at 50 there. I'm going to turn it down to 10. So now this is just 10 samples for the entire shape. We're going to lose all of those little curls probably. Yeah, now it's just a wonk because it's just 10 points that it's now smoothing between and then finishing the shape. So that's kind of how... You know, I'm using a fidelity to change the amount of detail. And this might be, maybe this is the shape when it's far off in the distance and it's just a tiny little point in the screen. Maybe it only just does 10 samples of that shape. And it's like, eh, it's kind of like a circle. And you're not going to see any more detail. But because it's just a tiny point on the screen, that's okay. Um, yeah. So that's that's another one of the issues that I, I ran into. And the, the biggest problem um, with... Uh, objects spending too much time drawing on the screen, even though they're just a tiny little thing on the screen. The main problem with that is actually not the thing becoming too bright. Um, that's one of the problems. The main thing is, is that 
I'm just wasting too much time drawing it on the screen because I only have so much time every frame to go and draw all of the details of the screen. If I spend a whole bunch of time drawing all these tiny little details off in the background, then it's like, oh, well, you know, your frame rate just dropped to like 10 frames a second because you spent so much time drawing that. So this is a, a technique that I use to uh, allow me to draw more objects to the screen in a 3D scene. Yeah. So I think that that's pretty much the gist of uh, the things that I wanted to go over. If you wanted to, uh, if we wanted to do maybe any uh, q and I'd love to answer any questions that you guys have, or we could just chat about anything else, yeah. Uh, looks awesome, uh, Alan. I hadn't, uh, I hadn't seen it the, because of the pandemic, the vector thing in a while, so I didn't, that first 3D scene that you were showing, mm. it's pretty, I hadn't seen it before, I was pretty... Nice. It's pretty sweet. Looks like you put a lot of work into this. Yeah, there's a Dirty Rectangles presentation where I go over some of the progress um, getting to this point. Um, and I think that there is some new content in there, even if, like, on top of what I showed you here today, uh, it's probably worth going back uh, and checking on. I've got it on YouTube, and I think it's on the Dirty Rectangles Twitch as well. Yeah, for sure. I'll check it out. I think uh, Jared has some questions. He doesn't have a mic, but he typed them in. Oh, oh, cool. Yeah, I'll just check in the chat then. Okay. <clears throat> um, so the first question about why I'm settling off screen rather than just settling at the last drawn uh, sample. Um, I, the main reason that I've chosen to do this is I'm kind of thinking back because I've had different oscilloscopes. I've actually gone through a couple of oscilloscopes already. This is my third, I think, um, trying to find one that was nice for this. Um, and I'm not sure if that's the case with this one because I can kind of adjust the intensity to much, much, like I can have a lot more control over the intensity than I did on the other oscilloscopes. But what I found is that if, let's say, I have a very simple frame and it doesn't take too long to draw it and, I'm, and I, let's say, leave it on one point um, or I, you know, let's say, recentered it at zero, zero instead or did something like that, uh, what ends up happening is even with the intensity turned way down, sometimes having that beam sit there for a really long period of time, it will start to show. So it would make, um, even though I've turned off the beam, it's not fully turned off, so it would make that certain point brighter. Um, or if I rested at zero, zero, you'd be able to see it on the center of the screen, just this tiny little faint dot coming in. Um, so having it totally off screen is just kind of the safe answer, where even if uh, let's say I missed a frame because of performance reasons, um, and I end up sitting there for like a super long period of time. Even if that happens, then it's still kind of safe um, that I'm sitting off screen because I know it's it's going to be invisible even if it sat there for a while. Um, so that's why I'm settling it at negative one, negative one. Um, so have I tried rendering pixel graphics? So... I, I'm really, really sad to say that I have not yet. And the reason that I'm really sad to say that is because it's on my to-do list. I really want to. I want to do like raster animations with this. So um, because I can control the intensity of the electron beam as I go between samples, that means that I can use this vector display as a raster display and draw scan lines back and forth and then just modulate the intensity, modulate the brightness of that beam as it goes across the screen. Uh, so by doing that, I can draw out a full raster scan. I can use this just like a raster CRT. Um, and that is exactly what a raster CRT does. Um, it's just that it's got a bunch of stuff in hardware to do the control of the beam. And I'd be basically in software controlling the beam, but it's, it's the exact same thing. Um, so yeah, definitely I will. And then with those shapes, because, you know, these are just samples with moduling, modulating brightness, I can have that in my vector, uh, in my 3D vector space, um, and I can have those, those raster uh, kind of scanned out raster textures or whatever being drawn in 3D space, and I can rotate them and scale them and transform them in any other way that you might want to. Um, now, the interesting thing about that is because, is that like my dynamic fidelity will be a little bit more tricky 
because I might have like, oh, this is the number of scan lines. And then when it gets close to the screen, you can see like in each individual line. And when it gets further away, it becomes like a, a much clearer image as the scan lines like kind of blur together, but maybe it gets way too bright as it gets smaller on the screen. So like, yeah, it's gonna be interesting. Some interesting problems to solve there, but it'll be a neat effect. Um, I don't know if you, I don't know if you went over this. My internet has been a bit spotty, but um, uh, did you did you talk about how you select that level of fidelity um, based on distance? Is it like an arbitrary uh, kind of like an arbitrary decision on how you do your dynamic LOD, or is there like some math behind that? Yeah, I'll show you here. This is my sampler class. Um, so what I do here, uh, boop, boop, boop. I'm just going to look for, um, so if it is a per perspective, obviously if it's an orthographic or actually, yes, if it's an orthographic, then there is like distance from the camera. It doesn't mean that it's going to be smaller on the screen. Therefore, fidelity is always one for orthographic. Um, but with per perspective, uh, the distance from the camera means that it's going to be smaller on the screen or bright bigger on the screen. So that's when I calculate fidelity. Um, the fidelity calculation is just some really basic trigonometry. Uh, um, I just multiply the distance from the camera by, um, well, tan of the FOV over two. <laughs> um, the way that I calculated that is, is just um, the whole Sokatoa uh, trigonometry stuff where I just say that, oh, the camera, well, you've got a triangle basically formed by the um, uh, FOV of the camera and the distance to that cam uh, distance from the camera. And then that's, that's kind of just, I use some angles there. And the math was pretty simple. I, to be honest, not 100% sure that it's, absolutely perfect but it was definitely uh oh this is definitely close enough if i use that trigonometry and it seems to work pretty well so that's that's pretty cool and like so is it like you have three thousand samples and like as your fidelity goes gets i guess small and small, it approaches zero i guess is that the idea yeah okay cool so with the three thousand samples um if you're drawing things like weirdly like if you're drawing something in the very far left and the very far right does that reduce the number of samples you have because the uh like the beam has to move across the screen a lot? uh the number of samples that i have like per frame to work with yeah yeah so my uh the way i wrote my engine is it's uh, has a dynamic frame rate so there is no like i have maybe a target frame rate and my target frame rate uh, the only reason that that comes into play is I say, oh, if I finish drawing my scene before the end of the target frame rate, then let's move off screen and just wait there for a bit because there's no point in redrawing the scene. Otherwise, it's just going to start becoming too bright compared to the next frame, which might end up taking a lot longer to draw. Um, so that's where the target frame rate comes into play. But really, I could just scrap that all together. I could set my target frame rate to be like a thousand frames per second and just like go as fast as you can. And what that means is that it's going to go and it's going to draw. And if it takes way too long to draw it, then, well, it took way too long to draw it. And maybe it took, you know, a full 40th of a second to draw that frame. And then when it's finished, well, then it'll start drawing the next frame and then it'll start drawing the next frame. It just, the frame rate is very fluid and dynamic in that regard. Uh, now the problem with that is let's say I finished drawing a frame and it took, you know, a full 20th of a second or something crazy like that, like a long time to draw this entire frame. And then I move on to the next one. That takes a full 20th of a second. When I'm running at 20 frames per second, uh, sorry, yeah, 20 frames per second, that means that uh, you're going to start getting a flicker on the screen. Just like the old CRTs when they're running at a low refresh rate, um, you will see that flicker. You'll see the, the shape, um, uh, yeah, flicker, because it's not being refreshed uh, very quickly. It's, it's taking a, you know, it's a slow refresh. Um, yeah. So that's, that's that. Does that answer your questions? Yeah, I think so. Um, the other part of that question was just like, just doing wild sort of, uh, distances between samples. Does that actually have an impact? Yeah. So, um, 
Let's go back to my other scene here. Actually, I'm going to do one other thing here. I'm going to turn off the uh, the blanking. Um, yeah, so uh, as, let's say I'm moving from one point to another point that's very close to it. I'm going to need to blank, but the amount of extra samples I'm going to need to put in there to slow the beam down and get it to settle on the new point before it turns the beam back on is very, it's very small. It's a small number of samples because it's a point that is close to it. Let's say I'm going to a point that's way on the other side of the screen. That means I'm going to need to spend a lot more samples slowing the beam down before um, I settle on that new point because it's coming from way far away. So it takes, takes more samples to slow it down to settle the oscillations and get it stable. Um, that means that I'm now wasting more time doing that, as you, you know, just hinted at. Um, so there is benefit to drawing these um, shapes um, in a certain order that's kind of optimized, so that it doesn't need to spend a whole bunch of time going all the way from one side of the screen, back to the other side of the screen, back to the other side, and back, like, that will waste a lot of time on my frame. Um, so you can see on this scene, uh, I'm drawing the, the, the ground, like the ground dots, uh, just like in a kind of, some of them are actually off in the distance. So there's actually very few samples spent blanking between them. Um, and that's kind of a, would be, that's better than drawing them left to right, because if I draw them left to right, then there's kind of more time spent in between the dots, but drawing them off into the distance means that there's very little time spent in between the dots when they're off in the distance. Um, so there are some optimizations I can make there. I actually wrote some code and we'll see if it works. I'm going to, I'm going to try and show some code that, um, sorts the shapes really in a rudimentary kind of way, just drawing one shape and then saying, what's the next closest shape? Draw that one. What's the next closest shape? Draw that one. And, uh, to try and reduce the amount of time spent blanking between uh, between shapes. So let's see if I can I just need to remember where this is. Uh, here we go. So this is what I just described there, which does a very, very basic sorting. Okay, yeah. Um, just did some refactoring. So maybe this will work. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. So now you can see um, this is the same scene, uh, but now there's, you know, theoretically less time spent blanking between shapes because it's trying to optimize how these shapes are drawn to the screen. Um, this at first was a very promising approach, but what I found in initial, uh, initial tests, um, I'm actually going to switch over to a different scene, which really shows this breakdown, basically. Um, and this was a big surprise to me. Um, I was expecting this to be the answer, kind of like the solution. I was inspired by a guy um, who recreated asteroids for a vector display. Wow, that's flickery. OK. I think that's flickery because I, oh, yes. No, no. I don't know why that's so flickery. Anyway, um, so here's a different scene. And what I found with this scene, uh, maybe better if I actually turn on my blanking again, because the blanking really helps. 
Um, so what I ended up finding, this is with sorting on. Uh, is this going to reproduce the issue? A little bit. Um, yeah, this isn't a good demo of it. But what ends up happening is, let's say, I'm just going to describe to you the problem here. Uh, let's say uh, frame one, um, I draw shape A, then B, then C. Then frame two, because of the sorting, it was actually, it's actually more optimal to this frame, draw shape B, then C, then A, because that'll reduce the amount of uh, time the beam needs to spend moving around the screen. Um, so what this means now is that instead of shape A being refreshed at every one, let's say, 80th of a second, now it's basically being refreshed in 1 40th of a second, because it needs to wait. In, it was from the beginning of the first frame. Now it needs to wait until the end of the second frame before it's finally drawn. So now the refresh rate of that shape has decreased because the order of the shapes has changed. Um, so that re results in a flicker and a jitter as, you, as the scene changes. And unfortunately, you can't really see it with this demo. A little bit there. There's a little bit of jitter there, but the frame rate also is not great on this, and I'm not sure why. I think I just changed the fidelity of things, but... Anyway, um, what I ended up finding was that immediately there was this this jitter and kind of like a flicker and a jitter on uh, on uh, shapes as the scene changed because instead of shapes having a constant refresh rate, now they had a dynamic refresh rate based on when during the frame they were redrawn to the scene. Um, so the idea of sorting, actually not a great idea. The correct solution for this type of display is to just deal with the fact that, hey, maybe there's going to be a suboptimal amount of uh, time spent blanking between shapes, but the result of drawing every shape always in the same order means that every shape will always have a consistent refresh rate and won't flicker, and it'll be nice and consistent and smooth on the screen. Your animations will be smooth without any jitter. Um, yeah, so maybe that, that describes an interesting issue that I was surprised to find as I was working on this. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Great explanation. <laughs> okay, yeah, Jared's asking if uh, sorting uh, infrequently would help. Um, so the naturally, as shapes go on and off the screen, um, there is kind of like a change of order that kind of ends up happening um, because maybe you're just not drawing this shape at all this frame because it's not on the screen. Um, so there is kind of a little bit of fluidity to it, and that's basically okay. Um, but yeah, sorting, sorting infrequently. It's not something that I've experimented with. It'd be an, it's like an interesting uh, thought exercise anyway. Um, I think that like more importantly than sorting infrequently would be like sorting gradually, like shifting a shape up in the draw order um, slowly, frame by frame. Like maybe it's shape A, B, C, D, and then maybe it's shape a, B, D, C, and then maybe A, D, B, C, and then D, A, B, C, um, as you kind of sh shuffle it frame by frame. Um, and then that would end up resulting in a shape that's refresh rate is not like jumping from, you know, once every frame to basically two full frames before it, uh, uh, sorry, uh, an extra frame before it gets refreshed. So you're kind of shifting it along this, the, the order. That might be a, kind of like the better approach. Um, to answer Jared's question about if he wanted to play the stuff that I make, how much would it cost you? Um, the audio DAC that I bought was something like 230 bucks, 260 bucks, something like that. It's a PreSonus Studio 26C. I link it on my blog. Um, there's a blog post that I had that went into the de details on it. It is a pretty cheap. Uh, audio DAC with DC coupling. You need one with a DC, DC coupling, um, and this is probably the cheapest that you can get. Uh, so, you know, you'd need that. Um, you need a computer that runs Windows, I think Windows 10 probably. Um, I'm just using .NET, um, just like .NET standard. So you do need a Windows computer. 
And then you need an oscilloscope. So you can get one of those on eBay for probably uh, 200, 200, 300 bucks, something like that. Um, yeah, so you're looking about five, $600 to get the hardware. And then you might need some audio cables um, to hook up you know, the audio DAC to the oscilloscope. Uh, DigiKey has some nice little um, uh, adapters. Just pull them out. These little uh, BNC adapters for, uh, it's an RCA plug, which is convenient because RCA to quarter inch, which is the output of the PreSonus, um, is an easy cable to get. And then there's these little adapters that are just uh, BNC connectors, which connect to the oscilloscope. And then voila, I can plug that straight into my oscilloscope. And then for full detail, you need an oscilloscope that has a Z input, um, ideally modulation uh, up to five volts, um, or this one is actually a two volt full modulation. That's perfect. Most of them are usually five volts. So that's the, you need a DC coupled Z, Z input, not a, an AC coupled Z input. Uh, your oscilloscope needs to be a two channel at least, um, and it needs to have XY mode. XY mode is on most two channel oscilloscopes. So that's easy to find. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a gist. It's, it's not too bad, but, um, yeah, yeah, it's all up on GitHub. It makes me think, um, I remember when you got the first one and it was super exciting and then I thought you were going to get a second one and that would be like the Bayal and all, but you mentioned that you have three. Yeah. So I bought one from China, um, and I learned some lessons about, uh, buying clones from China. Um, it's a pain to return them, which I ended up doing, but um, just because shipping is like brutally expensive. But it's the it's kind of hard to read the specs on these machines. Um, there's manuals that describe like what sensitivity it should have, and the one that I got from China, it 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 was a really really cheap clone of an old Hitachi uh, oscilloscope. And it was quote unquote, maybe even brand new. I'm not, I'm not sure when it was produced. Um, not too many places produce CRT, just CRTs like at all anymore. Uh, all the factories are shut down. <laughs> so maybe this is, you know, produced, produced recently. It's an ROHS, um, compliant one. So must be fairly recent. Um, and it had this issue where, uh, the X channel went in XY mode, um, it was as if it wasn't properly DC coupled. So with AC coupling, um, what ends up happening with a signal is uh, it, you're expecting it to be oscillating around zero. So let's say there's a, a DC offset or it's always like oscillating, let's say around one volt or something like that. When it's AC coupled, that one volt offset will be corrected so that that becomes zero and you'll just see the differences in the oscillations around uh, the zero point. Well, that doesn't work when I want to precisely control where the beam is on the screen. Um, and I can turn it to EC coupling here and I'll show you what that looks like. Yeah, you can see it kind of wobbling around as it, I have no idea what it's doing. Anyway, AC coupling obviously just doesn't work for this kind of a display. Um, so DC coupling means that, um, instead of correcting that DC offset, it won't correct it. It'll just control the beam directly. Um, so this cheap Chinese one that I got was the clone, uh, the clone of the Hitachi one, uh, did not have very good DC coupling, even though it was DC coupled, it, it seemed to kind of like take a long time to settle when I changed the image on the screen. And that ended up meaning that my whole image kind of shifted and wobbled, especially if I had points when I left the electron beam on for a long period of time at a certain point, then it would really mess with the signal and it would oscillate and wobble around. So yeah, that one I ended up returning. Um, the first scope that I had did not have a Z input, so I couldn't turn off the beam. I couldn't modulate the intensity of the beam. Um, and then, yeah, this, this third scope that I got is, it's got a Z input that has a two volt, um, uh, you know, full modulation, which is ideal, because uh, the PreSonus audio DAC that I have outputs 3.6 volts, 
between negative 3.6 and positive 3.6. So I can fully cover the range of modulation that this oscilloscope expects for a Z input, which is ideal. Um, yeah. So sorry, I'm I'm rambling for for quite a bit here, but uh, if you guys have more questions, I can go over them. But um, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time, Alan. This was awesome. Thanks. It was fun. <laughs>